Hello and welcome to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we wind down Breast Cancer Awareness Month, October, we've invited Dr. Jason Williams into studio today with us, uh, a returning guest to talk about um, his new minimally invasive uh, cancer, breast cancer uh, treatment. Uh, he was here before and we talked about uh, some of the options uh, available that are far less invasive than almost, as Dr. Williams said, 100 years of mastectomy and, and lumpectomy. And he's returned today to talk about uh, this new minimally invasive breast cancer treatment and also to talk about new cancer immunotherapy medications and how to make them more effective uh, with less side effects and, more importantly, how to make them affordable for for more people. How are you doing today, Dr. Williams? I'm doing great, Neil. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for returning with us. When we were here before, we were talking uh, about this new minimally invasive breast cancer treatment that uh, is essentially scarless because it uses, uh, it, it implements needles rather than uh, scalpels in um, removing or killing cancer cells. Uh, it's called cryoablation. Uh, you were talking about that, and um, we segued into dis a discussion about immunotherapy drugs and how um, their price some sometimes quite quite high, as a matter of fact, so high that, that many of us just don't uh, even view them as an option. Um, you've had a lot of experience with these drugs, um, having uh, obtained your medical doctorate from Louisiana State University, uh, completed an internship uh, in internal medicine, followed there by a residency in radiology at the University of South Alabama. You, you've also trained doctors on image-guided cancer therapy here in the United States, Mexico, and South Africa as well. So you've had a well-rounded um, experience with all sorts of, of cancer treatments, and they're all pretty pricey. But when it comes to some of these immunotherapy drugs, they're even more so. Is is that uh, a, a correct yes. assumption? That's that's very correct, and and, that, and that's the thing is that these drugs are showing great success. Um, you know, far more successful than the standard chemotherapy agents. And um, there's been a lot of work actually. A lot of it came out of Harvard, where these drugs essentially were were developed. And uh, what they showed was that basically the immune system should have the capability to attack and kill cancer, but what's happening is the um, the cancer is telling the immune system that it's part of your own body, and it's trying to keep the immune system from attacking it. So these new drugs, uh, the first one, which is uh, it's a, it goes under the name Ipilimumab, which is uh, a trade name Zirovoid, was uh, uh, FDA approved in 2011 for melanoma, mm -hmm. and then last year we got a couple of new drugs that are of a different class, that but they work in kind of the same way. And what they do is they block these receptors that the cancer is using to trick the immune system so that the immune system can essentially recognize the cancer mm -hmm. and attack it. Unfortunately, these are some of the most expensive drugs in, in the United States with a price tag of... Uh, Two to three hundred thousand dollars. Ooh, that's a quarter, that, a quarter of a million dollars for. Uh, is this now? We're talking about the entire treatment uh, from beginning to end, or just it, these drugs? You're talking about just these drugs for, and, and, and this is for maybe a year, but really, um, that's a little bit of a, a, a trick because the drug year boy, that's only four doses. So that you know they give it every three weeks, uh, four times, and then they're kind of off. For a while, mm -hmm. uh, the other drugs, which are known as PD-1 inhibitors, and there's two different ones that are available. Those are usually given every two to three weeks, but they're they're still significantly ex expensive, and they've shown great success in in just numerous cancer types. But the, one of the problems is that if we put all the patients with you know advanced cancer on these drugs, it'll break the system. Um, one of the doctors from Stone Kettering was saying at a major cancer meeting that it would cost hundreds of billions of dollars a year just to treat advanced cancer patients in the United States, and uh, and the system just can't handle it. Well, so, is, is it is the manufacture of these drugs that uh, intricate, that specialized, that they have to be priced you know, so high? I mean, we're, we're basically talking about yeah. good old-fashioned chemotherapy, right? Well, you know, and these, these drugs are a little more specific. They're they're what we call uh, monoclonal antibodies, right. which are which are biologic agents. So they are more expensive to produce, 
and uh, and and these drugs, you know, are made by some of the major uh, pharmaceutical companies in, in existence, some of the larger ones. And uh, you know, obviously, I guess they're they're trying to to recoup a lot of their investment in this, but um, but they are more expensive to make than standard chemotherapy. Now, these drugs can be di- di- directly injected into the cancer. Um, and you, you can right. use a needle to do that. Now, are we talking about killing the cancer so that there's no more need for lumpectomies or mastectomies? Well, so, yes, so, you know, one, one thing, of course, the way that these drugs are typically given, you know, you give them intravenous, and you get, you know, have to give a large amount, so you're, you know, you're flooding the whole body, um, really to try to uh, enact a response at the tumor location. And so there's been some animal studies that have come out of the, the Netherlands where they actually um, would take cancer in, in the animal model and they would inject it with the immunotherapy drugs. Mm-hmm. And what they found was that they could get a good or even better response using a fraction of the dose. And so we've kind of translated that in, into uh, human work where you know, we, we figure based off of the animal studies, we can use probably one eighth of the dose that is, is needed, um, and inject it directly into the tumor. And so that's certainly one thing it reduces cost. But the other thing is it, it, uh, it reduces side effects as well. And where you really want to change the immune response is at the tumor site. If you can educate the immune system to attack the tumor, which the best place to do that is, is at the tumor itself, then, um, then you can the immune system can learn and will have a memory and will know that it needs to to attack that tumor and not only just where you treat but can can do it throughout the whole body and so that's what us the future for these these drugs is to be able to to do that and that that should make it a lot more cost effective it will certainly reduce side effects and hopefully will increase the availability of these drugs because there are probably at least 20 different cancer types right now that are being, you know, heavily studied and they, you know, they have approval already for melanoma. Some of the drugs have approval for non-small cell lung cancer, but it's uh, quickly going to be across the board for, for many cancer types. And this will, will really hope it open things up to where more patients can get this type of treatment and that it'll be more cost effective. So when we were talking about the billions of dollars that it would take to to treat, uh, you know, just people who have advanced uh, stage cancer, uh, when we're talking about breast cancer being Breast Cancer Awareness Month, uh, what are the numbers as far as breast cancer? You know, we see the pink ribbons uh, everywhere in in October and, you know, throughout the year, actually, because all of us have been touched by breast cancer in one way or another. I, I just can't see, you know anybody who's right. who doesn't know someone who's been touched by it uh, when we're talking about the sure. numbers what are we talking about here sure so in in the united states there's there's 231,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer uh every year mm-hmm. in addition to that there's actually there's uh what they call uh carcinoma in situ which can you know can be considered either an extremely early form of cancer or some people consider it more of a precancer there's about 62,000 cases of those, and uh, and and then out of all these, you see about 40,000 deaths per year of breast cancer. So even even with the treatment options of mastectomy, lumpectomy, radiation, chemo, um, there's still the you know a fair number of people dying from breast breast cancer. And with those type of numbers, yeah, it's hard to not know somebody that's uh, that's affected by it. Um, I know for me. Personally, my grandmother died of breast cancer, which is one of the reasons why, you know, I'm very, very interested in this work. Now, um, when we're talking about the these, uh, this pre-cancer or uh, I guess early form of cancer, is this just something that indicates the possibility of cancer developing, or is it actual cancer that can be treated now with this invasive uh, method in early stage detection and make it even more right. cost effective? Is that an option? Yes, and, and it is. And, and, and this cancer, which they, they call ductal carcinoma in situ, is kind of, it's very controversial. Um, you know, for many, many years, the patients were treated very aggressive, just like if they had a, a, an invasive cancer. So they were, they were even actually, some of them were treated more aggressive because most of them were given mastectomy, they were given radiation, they were given chemotherapy. And, and, and those therapies are not 
not benign. And when you look at it, the, the patients that have this uh, ductal carcinoma, their their risk of actually developing an invasive breast cancer is only about 20%. So, these, you know, a large number of patients are, are essentially being over-treated for this. And and uh, most most patients were unaware. I mean, I've I've seen plenty of patients who had this this type of precancer, and from what they knew, they, they didn't know any difference than a person who had invasive cancer. They they didn't realize that their cancer or their situation may not even become cancer. And uh, obviously, it, it does help pad the statistics a lot because it increases your your uh, treatment success if you throw all these people into uh, the breast cancer category, since only 20% were going to get it. Um, I do think that for uh, cryoablation for the, for the future for these patients, this could be something that could be a, a great option because you could go in and freeze this area that's essentially a precancerous area and get rid of it before it becomes cancer. Certainly, some of them may have it, you know, in a large area and it may not be amenable to that. But it's very much like the idea of women with cervical cancer. Obviously, they do, you know, uh, pap smears and they can detect, uh, precancerous lesions there that may have a chance to become cancer. And they go and they, they, uh, may burn off part of the cervix and they freeze part of the cervix. And I think that in the future for the breast, you can see the same, same type of treatment. I, I'd like to ask you, uh, about some of the new guidelines for breast cancer screening that the American Cancer Society has just uh, come out with. And um, in your opinion and in your experience, what is the best type of uh, screening to detect this uh, early form cancer even even before it becomes cancer, as you said? Sure, sure. So, so certainly, you know, mammography has really led to the increased detection of this uh, before mammography existed, patients who had this type of precancerous condition, they were undetected and obviously they weren't found unless they actually became cancer. Um, now the American Cancer Society has kind of changed some of the, the guidelines. Before, um, you know, it was really 40 and over, you know, get a yearly mammogram. Even years back, sometimes they would have patients get them as early as 35. Now the new guidelines are really starting more at 45. And so patients from age 45 to um, to 55, they're essentially supposed to get a you know a recommended yearly mammogram. Um, patients older than that would get one every two years. And uh, and and the the problem is is that there is a fair number of patients who are under the age of 45 who who get breast cancer, and they tend to get you know pretty aggressive breast cancer. And and we may start missing some of those people. By uh, by this new uh, these new guidelines, but the, one of the problems was is that you know the patients with all the screening they were getting a lot of unnecessary biopsies. Younger women tend to have a lot of different benign non cancerous conditions that were heavily worked up. I mean, I I, I think it, you'd find it very hard to to uh, talk to women and not find at least a large number who've at least had a biopsy before, and so. So, you know, these, these uh, guidelines are a little bit controversial. Certainly women with uh, family history, they need to consider getting mammograms at an earlier age. We, we always recommend 10 years prior to whatever their closest relative, whatever age they had breast cancer. So if they had a mother that has breast cancer at age 45, then they should start their uh, annual screening at age 35. Um, so the other thing is, is that for many, many years, you know, we had just the standard mammography and, and, uh, and used the film, film just like, uh, cameras used. And, uh, and then in the early 2000s, they came out with the digital mammography and everybody really made a, a you know, a, a big deal about it. Mm-hmm. Though it didn't really show as much, uh, increased detection, but the images were certainly of, of better quality. And, and I think most radiologists would, would argue and say that it did increase detection. But now uh, we have you know, a new technique that's known as a 3D mammogram, also called breast tomosynthesis. And this technique is really different in the fact that it looks kind of like a mammogram, but you're taking slices through the breast so that this overlapping tissue is not as much of a problem. And there's been several major studies com- comparing uh, that to standard digital mammography showing a 
40 to 50 percent increased detection in breast cancer. So, you know, from from my opinion, if women have the option to be able to get 3D mammography, that that's what they should really be shooting for because of the the, the enhanced detection with it. Great advice. Great advice. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. We've been in studio this afternoon talking with Dr. Jason Williams, a board-certified radiologist and pioneer in minimally invasive image-guided cancer therapies. And we've been here talking about uh, new, highly effective immunotherapy drugs that um, have a prohibitive cost, up to a quarter of a million dollars in, in most cases, for uh, just four doses. But uh, Dr. Williams has been researching and implementing a very unique uh, technique with equal or better results, uh, fewer side effects, uh, substantially lowering the cost and hopefully bringing, a, well, hopefully bringing hope to many who would otherwise um, not be able to afford uh, these new highly effective drugs. It's been great talking with you today, Dr. Williams. Thank you, Neil. I appreciate it. Good talking with you as well. Thank you. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm, and you can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes.